Whether you're in a different state, hey, we had someone reach out for some church merch from West Lafayette, someone from Purdue. Why don't we give it up for him one time? Welcome, my brother. Hey, if you're watching from, gosh, if you're watching from Virginia or Washington or even our, we visited some friends in Ohio last week, we just want to say welcome. Whether you're watching on YouTube later, hey, I missed you all. I was gone last week. I heard a few people say they missed me. If you didn't miss me, don't tell me. I'll feel better, all right? Uh, but thank you for your prayers, for real. Uh, myself, my wife, um, Aaron, Jackson, and Erica, we were visiting a church in Ohio, Antioch Church. They are amazing. We really believe in the power of mentorship here. Hear me very clearly, young lead pastor telling you I very much believe in the power of mentorship. There's no way we'd be here where we're at as a church without the power of mentorship, without someone discipling me, discipling our team. And so we think it's worth taking a Sunday off to go visit someone and say, hey, can you just pour into us? Like, we have a lot of questions. We need some uh, discernment and wisdom on where you're taking one church. But I want to shout out Phil Nettleton. He gave an amazing word last week, wherever Phil's at. Give it up for him. <laughs> Phil, I, don't, I can't. Okay, he's somewhere. Okay, I see him. Hey, I mean this dead serious. Phil and uh, Kevin Batman, they are my elders here at One Church. We have mentorship from other churches, and our denominational structure has a board that's local here. But Phil and Kevin, as, as the kind of local elders here, I just want to honor them. They have poured so much into me. Kevin's over at the Westland Church, and Phil has been a, a missionary for his whole life. And so him and Lucille, they're dear friends of ours. So can you just give it up for them one time? We're so grateful. This is a multi-generational, multi-ethnic church. We're unashamed about that, but I would just love if you would uh, bow your heads and let's pray together. Let's jump into the word. Father, I'm so thankful that when we walk with you, we are victorious. Lord, whether we are in the valley or we are on the mountaintop this morning, God, I thank you that you lead us in triumphal procession. That no matter what we're going through, I thank you that your word is very clear that you will take everything that the enemy intended for evil. Every bad health report we had this week, every time someone said something that messed with us or someone did something that was rude to us this week or maybe we had a situation that was unfair, God, I thank you that you hold the keys of our destiny in your hands. There's no man and there's no demon that could ever take it away. And so we thank you in advance, Lord. I pray for this message specifically, God, that you would hide me behind your cross, that I would not get in the way of what you want to do over the next hour or so, Lord. We pray that your kingdom would come, your, your will would be done here on earth as it is in heaven. In Jesus' name, everybody said amen and amen. When I said over the next hour, I'm not going to preach for an hour, so don't get all worried, all right? <laughs> But I, I miss you all. I'm glad to be back. We are in the book of Deuteronomy this morning, but the series that we've been in is the simple gospel. Has anyone been transformed this series? We just want to make it very simple. I know on Facebook and news media and CNN and Fox, it's like, your truth is my truth, and everyone's kind of trying to get along, and maybe you believe in that religion or this religion. We're really unashamed here about the power of the name of Jesus. He is the way, the truth, and the life. There is no other way to heaven and for such a time as this, we need to bring it back to the simple gospel. Can I get an amen? And so we don't want to overcomplicate it. We want to meet you where you're at. Maybe you walked in here this morning and you're fired up to hear a word. Maybe you're watching online and you're like, I'm not so sure about this Jesus thing, right? We've all been there before. I've been there, right? I just want to welcome you wherever you're at. Just know this before I even preach a word to you, you are loved. You are loved. That there's nothing you could do, there's nothing you can strive to earn your way into heaven, but the narrow way that's in Jesus is by grace through faith alone. And it's a free gift of salvation that he offers you. He meets you right where you're at. But we're in the book of Deuteronomy, the Old Testament. This is the fifth book of the Bible in the Old Testament. And Moses is the author. And he's getting ready to share with them this word that God has given him because they're about to be blessed like never before. Just turn to your neighbor and just say, like never before. Turn to the person behind you and say, like never before. Does anyone in the room want to be blessed like never before? My first thing I want to encourage you with is that the greatest blessing is not any materialistic gift that you are just thinking of, but it's Jesus. He is the greatest gift. He is the best promise, greatest fulfillment gift that you could ever be given. 
And so in the book of Deuteronomy, Moses is telling them, they're about to be blessed like never before. But in your subtitle, if you're in the NIV version, it says, but do not forget. Everybody say, do not forget. It says, do not forget the Lord. Do not forget that the air that's in your lungs right now, the fact that you have food on the table, the fact that, yeah, your mashed potatoes weren't warmed up as exactly as you wanted them in the microwave, right? But you have food on the table. Are you with me? Every single good thing that is in your hands is a gift from the Lord. You probably just don't know it yet. That relationship that you've been praying for, the job that you've been praying for that was just fulfilled, every single blessing in your life is the fingerprint of God's grace on your life. Just the fact that we're alive, our heart is beating, is a sign of his grace on us. And so this is where Moses is coming from. This is his heart posture. Deuteronomy chapter 8. We're going to look through 20 verses, but we're going to unpack it a section at a time. So verses 1 through 5. Be careful to follow every command I'm giving you today. So that you may live and increase and may enter and possess the land the, the, land the Lord promised on oath to your ancestors. Anyone believe in the house that God is good? That he is full of blessing, full of abundance. He's about to bring them into the promised land. But remember how the Lord your God has led you all the way in the wilderness these 40 years. What took 40 years should have taken them 40 days. They got out of the Red Sea, right? The Red Sea parts. They got out of slavery. And then they should have went right into the promised land. But God led them through the wilderness because of their hard hearts. And then eventually they enter into the promised land as Joshua led them through the Jordan. But this is where they're at. They're coming out of the wilderness Remember how the Lord has led you all this way, these 40 years, to humble and to test you in order to know what was in your heart, whether or not you would keep his commands. He humbled you, causing you to hunger and feeding you with manna, which neither you nor your ancestors had known, to teach you that man does not live on bread alone. That would be a good Thanksgiving sermon. We could just live right there. But on every word that comes from the mouth of the Lord. Your clothes did not wear out and your feet did not swell during these 40 years. Know then... In your heart, that as a man disciplines his son, the Lord disciplines you. Here's the title of my sermon this morning, Level-Headed. Are you level-headed this morning when you look at the way that you walk with God? We have a lot of high highs and a lot of low lows. Can I get an amen? I know I've been there a lot this year. And story, just complete side note here for a second. One of the uh, high highs that's happened in our life recently is Lianza is pregnant again. So praise God. Come on. That's a blessing. Uh, that's, we're excited about that. Pray for me because I'm going to have to wake up in the middle of the night again. I just got past that season with Aliana. So I do covet your prayers. Um, it's interesting what kind of person you turn into at 3 in the morning, right? You just turn into this monster. Uh, I had no idea what was in me sometimes. Um, I'm exaggerating, Okay. I love Leanne's and my family, but honestly, we are so grateful. We have another child on the way. July 13th is the due date, and so uh, who says boy? Come on, who says boy? Come on. Okay, who says girl? The girl people are like, I know you're going to have another girl. I already decided. You're not going to have a boy, right? Okay, real talk. Girl? Okay, now who says boy? Yeah, okay, all right, all right. Well, we did a surprise last time, and I thought it was going to be a boy. It was not, but... I love Aliana. I wouldn't trade it for the world. She is my precious princess, and I am wrapped around her finger, if you were wondering. So here's a quick story, though. That was a high, high in my life. A low, low in this year of 2022 is my grandma passed away, and and she was a close friend of mine. Uh, She was a prayer warrior. She was someone that I would text, like I told you a few weeks ago at 3 in the morning. She's watching the Australian Open, probably. She's a big tennis fan, so she's up praying for me, interceding, like, you know when you lose someone close to you, it feels like you lost someone who was, like, fighting in the battle with you, you know, and it's like you're in the same war, and you look over, and you you feel like they should be there, you feel like when you're under attack, you should be able to, like, ask for encouragement, they're just not there anymore, and I remember, like, even seeing her in her casket, and I did her funeral, it was an amazing honor, And, and, like, just seeing her there, she was there, but she wasn't there, right, And that was a low, low for me. But just another story about her. This is kind of funny. She never used an alarm clock. So, I don't know. She was more spiritual than any of us, apparently. She told me that God would wake her up every day. And it was really right on the dot. Uh, I don't know about you, but I use an alarm clock to take out the trash. Anybody else? (laughs) I'm like, Monday morning, Holy Spirit. It's like, 
Leanne's, I don't know if she's in here right now, but like literally at 9.30, I swear the Holy Spirit sends an alarm off in my head or I have to set myself a reminder on my calendar because you don't want to miss trash day, right? You miss trash day, the wind's blown over your trash can, you're like chasing an Amazon box. Anybody been there? That was me a few days ago. But she, she never set an alarm and whether you are a believer or not, you might have think we're out of our minds because of how much we're praising Jesus this morning. Or maybe you love it. I don't know where you're coming from. But the first thing, if you're taking notes, is this. I think it's human nature to forget things. It just is. It's human nature to forget that your Amazon package was delivered when you were out of town. Can I get an amen? Right? First world problems. And then, you know, it's, it's human nature to forget to take out the trash. But it's human nature to forget the Lord in our sinful nature. It's just, it's just human nature to forget how good he's been to us. It's human nature to start to complain and get bitter and cynical. and Oh, man, like life is all right, but, you know, it's human nature. Deuteronomy 8.2, remember how the Lord has led you all the way in the, in the wilderness these 40 years. Everybody just say, remember. Amen. Remember. See, there's this point in the Psalms where you have to command your soul to praise. It's not a feeling. It's not an emotion. But you have to make a decision that thankfulness is not a holiday. It's a decision. Isn't it interesting how, like, humble America gets on Thanksgiving for, like, two seconds, right? But, but it's not just a holiday. It's, it's a daily decision. And the psalmist says, David says, I have to command my soul to praise. I have to command my soul to remember. But it's human nature to forget, right? To remember how God has led me all these years. Why is this so important? This is the basis of the rest of the conversation here. If the devil can't steal your soul, he will try to steal your perspective. Some of you are like, hey, I was singing that Maverick City song earlier, like I am free, I am Jesus's, but the devil still has your perspective on life. Like, like you are going to be in heaven, you have been bought with a price by the blood of Jesus, maybe you've been baptized as your next step, but your perspective is jaded on life, on what happens to you. At work, when somebody wrongs you, when someone cuts you off in traffic. Oh, the world is just out to get me. Here's the thing. All the way back to Genesis, the very first chapter, chapters of the Bible, the enemy's main goal has always been to jade your perspective of God. How did he get Adam and Eve to eat the fruit? He had to just jade the perspective of God's goodness just a little bit. Is God really for you? Did God really say that he was after your best? So the devil's after our perspective. This is how it's going to shape the rest of the conversation. So why does this matter? When we forget God, we lose our perspective. When we forget God's goodness, how he led us through those seasons, even though we, we were job searching and then literally a check came in the mailbox and God blessed you. You were praying for a spouse. You're like, I need someone to walk with and you just meet them. Like, it was a pure miracle how Leanne's and I even met. We met at Ball State. Neither of us went there. Like, just things like that. That you have to pause and just say, in the seasons when it gets tough, I have to remember. I have to call it out. One of the most powerful things the Lord has taught me is the power of journaling. And some of the guys in there are like, I would never journal, bro. Like, what are you talking? Journaling for me is not a cute little thing. It is a moment where I say, God, in 2016, I remember I was running from you. And then you landed me an internship with Awakened Ministries. Are you, are you with me? You're calling it out. You're calling and remembering. But when we forget God, we lose our perspective. So Deuteronomy 8, 6 through 9, observe the commands of the Lord, walking in obedience to him, revering him. For the Lord your God is bringing you into a good land, a land with brooks, streams, deep springs gushing out into the valleys and hills, a land with wheat and barley and vines and fig trees and pomegranates. Anyone seen that pomegranates YouTube video? Okay, nobody. No more pomegranates. Are you kidding me? Am I the only? Okay. All right. Do yourself a favor later in YouTube. No more pomegranates. Substitute teacher. All right. I believe there is no language in that. So verse 8, a land with wheat and barley, fig trees, pomegranates, olive oil and honey, a land where bread will not be scarce. You will lack nothing. A land where the rocks are iron and you can dig copper out of the hills. So as I read this, I'm probably talking to two different audiences, maybe three. 
Maybe one audience is saying, man, I'm on the mountaintop. Like at Thanksgiving dinner, you're like praising God for all these new blessings. Maybe it's a new child. Maybe it's a new job. Maybe you just moved into a new house. I don't know what that is. Maybe you're on the other spectrum. You're like, God, I'm just in the valley. And isn't it interesting how the holidays intensify those feelings? That for some reason, Thanksgiving and Christmas intensify the mountain and the valley. Because there's all, all this nostalgia. Maybe it reminds you of someone. I mean, maybe it's like, me in my position where, like, I want to text my grandma happy Thanksgiving, right? But, but you just remember it's different this year. It's different. Like, they, they were with us. Or maybe there's been a division in your family. You used to get together with them on Thanksgiving, but it's just not the same, right? Maybe the third audience is like, man, I kind of feel like I'm in a mountain in a valley at the same time. Anybody there this morning? I feel like that's been me. There's a few days you're like, man, I'm on the mountaintop. Oh, my gosh, I'm back in the valley, right? And I think this is just life. And if you're watching online or in the room, the, the question that my grandma asked, my other grandma recently, is when you get into those stages of life, maybe you get a bad health report or something, and, and there's a division in your family, how could, you, how could you walk through the mountains and the valleys without God? Like, I just don't understand. I heard someone say, it takes so much more faith to be an atheist than a believer. Like, I don't know how much faith you would have to have that this life is so tough on its own and so many setbacks and things people say, negative thoughts and violence and division, political chaos. Like, I don't know how you could do life without God. I just don't know. So maybe I'm talking to someone in the mountain. Maybe I'm talking to someone in the valley. Let's move to the next kind of way we're going to shape the conversation here, though. I think most of us, we let the mountain go to our head or the valley steal our heart. And I think this is the ebb and flow of life as a follower of Jesus. See, the devil is after your perspective. He wants the mountaintop to go to your head. He wants you to think that you're the greatest thing, that you made this all happen. The reason why your business is doing well. Can I just tell you that there's no such thing as luck? That is not a biblical frame of reference. But it's by the grace and the mercy of God that your business is doing well right now, that your family's healthy, but on the mountaintop, the enemy wants you to think it's because of you, or in the valley, he wants to jade your perspective of God. What do I mean by this? Let's go back to Deuteronomy, verses 10 through 14. When you have eaten, and I highlighted this word to mention, did anyone have baked mac and cheese this Thanksgiving? Any, okay, me, all right, cool. Anybody else? It's the best. When you have eaten and are satisfied, praise the Lord your God for the good land that he has given you. Be careful that you do not forget the Lord, failing to observe his commands, his laws, his decrees that I'm giving you this day. Otherwise, when you eat and are satisfied, I mean, really, just go back to your Thanksgiving dinner for a second. Some of you are like, I do not want to go back to that table. That was a crazy, all right. You don't have to tell me. But when you eat and you are satisfied, when you build fine houses and settle down, when your heart's and your flocks, when your herds and flocks grow large and your silver and gold increase and all you have is multiplied, maybe on the mountaintop your heart will become proud and you will forget the Lord who brought you out of Egypt, out of the land of slavery. The reason why Moses is communicating this is because God is speaking through him. God knows the human nature that when you're blessed, you in your human flesh become proud. And when you're in the valley, you think God is against you. You think the whole world's out to get you. The enemy is after your perspective on everything. Every single thing that happens to you. What is your perspective? I mean, think about it like this. Fast forward to the New Testament. Jesus is tempted, tested in the wilderness, right? Where does the devil lead him to? He leads him to the highest point of the temple. He says, if you would just throw yourself down from here. He's trying to over-promise and under-deliver. So let me just break it down even further. Let me give you a different way to think about it. Maybe on the mountain, your temptation is to diminish the Lord. To diminish the Lord. Or maybe in the valley, you can go to the next slide, it's to doubt the Lord. And I think this is what happens in the valley when you get that health report, when someone betrays you or something at work happens where like someone didn't give you the credit that you thought you were due. Like it's in the valley where Satan wants to convince you of one little root lie. God is not for you. 
If he can get you to believe that, then the rest of your obedience is out the door. Are you with me? Here's another way to look at it. On the mountain, maybe it's tempting to forget the Lord. In the valley, maybe the enemy has led you to the point where you have had so many issues with church people. It's like, I don't even believe in this anymore. I'm out. To forsake the Lord. Quick story that's really a serious story is about Michael Jordan. And uh, I was gone last week, so I get an extra sports analogy, all right? My favorite player, I'll make this really short, my favorite player of all time is Reggie Miller, okay? Hands down. That dude was a scrawny, like, shot weird, and I'm like, you know, I relate to him a little bit. And so he was the Pacers' best player of all time, but there's this moment in the Last Dance documentary on Netflix, talking about the Chicago Bulls, and Reggie's playing Michael Jordan. I love MJ, no shame, all right? I I like Jordans and all that. But he said that when he trash-talked Michael Jordan, Michael Jordan said, don't you dare mess with black Jesus. I don't know if you watched that. Okay, this is what MJ said, all right? Here's a little reference to just say this. The enemy, the devil, wants you to think you are a victim or a god. A lot of us probably at Thanksgiving are living in a victim mindset. Well, of course I didn't get that job because nobody else tries to give me a break. Nobody else sees my work. The enemy just wants to lead you to a point where he can convince you that the goodness of God does not follow you into the valley. But here's the beautiful thing is that it says that the Holy Spirit led Jesus into the wilderness. Are you with me? That God does not just ordain your mountaintops, he ordains your valleys. That this is a season, a period of time where God, his greatest goal for you is not to have every single materialistic thing you want. You know what he's after the most is your heart. So God intentionally ordains seasons, moments, times where he leads you into the valley to reveal what is in your heart. To shape your heart. He doesn't give you the job, ordains it so that he can see how you will respond. He doesn't open the door to the relationship because he wants you to see how much you're craving intimacy with someone else over Jesus. He ordains both. But the devil wants you to think you're a victim or a God. Kanye West called himself Jesus for I don't know how many years, right? This is a real, real idolatry thing. And maybe some of you are like, Andy, I'm not like Michael Jordan, Kanye West. I don't do that stuff. But do you, if you're being honest, think that you're your own provider sometimes? That you have to make the job happen. You have to put food on the table for your kids. Like, no, 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 God is your provider. God is your provider. He is the one that opens doors that no one can open, and he shuts doors that no one can shut. He holds the keys of your destiny. Maybe it's on the mountaintop, the, the, the mindset is, look at me. In the, in the valley, it's, woe is me. Maybe on the mountaintop, it's, I did this on my own. Or in the valley, I am alone. But we just talked about at the beginning of the service that Emmanuel means God with me, God with us. Can I just encourage someone in the room, what you're watching online, I don't know where you're coming from. God is not just with you on the mountaintop, he's with you in the valley. And it's actually in the valley where you often experience his nearness more than you ever have before. And in America, this is our perspective of God. You ready? I do good, God blesses me. I do wrong, God punishes me. What a jaded perspective. Yes, there is blessing in our obedience. Yes, there is discipline and punishment as we rebel against the Lord. But I think a lot of us have believed the lie that if I'm in the valley, I've done something wrong. I didn't get the job. I've done something wrong. I didn't get the relationship. I I did something wrong. Yeah, there's probably moments and times where it's like the Holy Spirit has to convict you and show you that you should probably show up on time for your job, right? Or, Or treat that other person that you wanted to date like a little bit nicer in conversation. Yes and amen. But God ordains not just our mountaintops, but he ordains our valleys. That sometimes, I can't preach this loud enough, sometimes the valley is the best gift God could ever give you this Christmas. And I know that in our American mindset just sounds like, I mean, if I had the car and the house, and like, I think I'd be more joyful. But oftentimes in Scripture it says their joy was greater in suffering 
than on the mountaintop. Yeah, yeah, happiness will come on the mountaintop. Happiness will end three days later. Joy is in the valley and the mountaintop if God ordains it, leads it, guides it. But joy is different than happiness. Joy is eternal. Joy is not dependent on your circumstances. And I think so many of us, when we get to Thanksgiving, we get at the table, we see the presence under the tree, we put all of our hope and our worth and our value, if that presence's gonna be there, if that person's gonna be there. And God is just reminding us that we already had everything we needed and it's in him. He is the author, the sustainer, the giver of all life. I love how Lecrae said it. He said it like this. Don't let the praise go to your head and don't let the criticism go to your heart. A lot of us, we walk into rooms at our job and our families and it's like we hang our hat on. If they could just give me one compliment. If they could just really notice what I do and really give me like the credit that I deserve to make sure that my my platform and my name, right? Or maybe it's the flip side. It's meant every time that person says something. But... Our validation doesn't come from people. It comes from Yahweh, our Father. Here's the second point for us this morning. If you're with me this morning, just just nod your head. Number two is this. Thankfulness reminds us of who we are and who God is. So Deuteronomy, when you have eaten and are satisfied, praise the Lord your God for the good land he has given you. Be, care, be careful that you do not forget the Lord. Isn't it interesting how they repeat certain phrases? Do not forget the Lord. Do not, that says it all throughout Proverbs. If you've ever read Proverbs, the father's talking to the son. He's like, do not forget this. Do not forget this. It is human nature to forget, right? And so I want to, give you a different way to unpack it. I don't know if you're an intellectual thinker, if you're someone that's more of a feeler, but I want to break it down like this, three different ways of God leading us into the valley. Number one, maybe God leads you into the valley. We talked about that. God ordains it. Maybe there's a season where there's a tragedy and a death, and it's like just in our biological makeup, in our human nature. Man, when someone passes away like my grandma did, there's a season where you are in the valley. And let me just be clear, if you're watching this online in the room, do not rush your season of grief. I've made that mistake so many times in my life. I'm an optimist by nature. I, I want to see the, the glass half full and not half empty. And I think in seasons of my life, I've rushed grief of a friendship ending, of a loved one passing away, a transition, right? So hear me very clearly. Don't rush your grief but don't stay in it when God has called you out at the same time, right? And I think a lot of times we walk around with this woe is me attitude. And I, I want to say this as, as kind as I can, but I think a lot of times we try to use our past as an excuse for future sin, right? And we say, because that happened to me, because that person passed away, because that person wronged me, that is not an excuse for future sin, that's not an excuse to mistreat someone else the way that they treated you. Are you with me? So here's the third thing that I would say, and this is where I want to really pause. Let's go back one time. Let's go back. Yep. I think oftentimes God didn't ordain it. It didn't have a tragic situation, but we in our human flesh, we let the mundane of life lead us into the valley. God didn't call you into it. Nothing crazy happened, but it's that Ikea bed. Are you kidding me? Right? Right? Hey, I was there. It's that Ikea David. It's, it's that person that cut you off in traffic. It's, oh my goodness, the Amazon package did not show up on time. My life is the worst. Can I just be really frank with you, right? The best leaders in the world don't let the mundane ruin their day. I don't think you heard me. The best leaders in the kingdom of God do not let the mundane ruin their day. And to be honest, I'm sick and tired of Christians walking around with a woe is me attitude when there are other believers on the other side of the planet losing their head for the name of Jesus. And we, we, we have something to complain about our Amazon package? No. No. We don't. And I say that in love. Because when we let this keep us in the valley... If you can't be faithful in the valley, how could God ever trust you on the mountaintop? Man, we have so much to be grateful for. 
you know that our valley in America is someone else's mountaintop? Like, think about that for a second. The things that you are critical and complaining about at the Thanksgiving table, so many millions of people would change just a day to sit in your shoes. Oh, but they didn't show up on time with my food. They didn't refill my Diet Coke. Man, we are just so prideful. Man, Lord, forgive us. I'm serious. Like, Lord, forgive us for the way that we have used people and had such an entitled spirit. And and hear me, I'm proud to live in America. I'm, I'm, I'm thankful for those who have served in our country. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about just the overall stigma. Man, we are so entitled here. And we think that we have an excuse for everything. You know, the truth is, the devil will always give you an excuse to complain. That's his job. He's pretty good at it. Maybe you're, you're, you're seeing it from a different perspective, though. Maybe you're like, okay, Andy, I hear what you're saying, but maybe it's this, don't compare your valley to someone else's mountain. And this is what we do on social media every time we scroll. And we are in a God-ordained season in the valley. God called you there. He called you to not have a relationship for a period of time. He called you to not have any sort of fame or influence for a period of time. He called you there, and then you compare yourself one swipe at a time to someone else's mountain. But the saddest part is you're missing the intimacy of God in that season. You're losing your focus, you're distracted, you're comparing. It's like, man, you sit at the Thanksgiving table and it's just like, well, they're having a great time, I never would. Man, I wonder if we just got on our knees, put that aside for a second and let the Holy Spirit fill us afresh, how much joy we would have, how much gratitude and thanksgiving we would have, right? And I I just wanna do that for a second. Would you just bow your heads? Close your eyes for a second. Just under your breath, just begin to call out the things that God has been so good to you in. Just, just under your breath, don't, don't cause a scene, just. Lord, forgive us for forgetting you. God, thank you for your grace and your mercy. Thank you that when when we forget you, you do not forget us. God, thank you that when we are faithless, you are faithful. In Jesus' name. Last point here is number three. The Lord is the God of the hills and the valleys. And I want to go to a point just before this. I know I'm skipping around, Ethan. Right before that, I want to put up this phrase. We stay stuck in the valley often because we can't move on from the past. Maybe it's your Thanksgiving table. Maybe during the holidays, it's like you're talking about the same thing that happened 10 years ago. Right? Right? It's like, man, that that happened like 15, 20 years ago. Why are we still talking about the same thing, right? I think oftentimes God ordains a season where we're in the valley, and then he wants to lead you to the mountain. He wants to bless you into a new season, but you are stuck in the past. You're stuck just, and can I just be real? This was me last night. Like God is leading us into so much as a church and and we're having another baby and it's like I can see all the blessing over here and then on this side of my brain I still see the grave and I still see like friends that I used to be friends with and it's like man like it's just human nature to get stuck in the past, right? And so maybe the encouragement you need to hear this morning is what Isaiah says, do not dwell on the past anymore. See God is doing a new thing. Can I get an Amen. He's doing a new thing. We can praise the Lord for that. Come on, he's doing a new thing in our life. We don't have to dwell. See, the devil's always after your perspective. So if he can't keep your head down or head too far up, he'll keep your head too much to the side to look to the left or to the right. What they're doing, how they're being blessed, what used to be, what you used to have. And God is just like, fix your eyes on me. 
close your eyes. Why do we close our eyes in prayer? It's not, yes, it's a reverence thing, but you know why we do it? So we can focus. We close our eyes so that we tune out everything else. God, I know they're in their season. And I know, God, that I used to be there. And I know you're taking me here. And when we close our eyes, it just allows you to focus on the Lord easier, right? But the Lord is the God of the hills and the valleys. He's faithful in both. And I want to take this a step further to say this. Oftentimes our thankfulness is just in the past. Here's where I want to challenge you this morning, all right? I want to take your thankfulness to a whole new level as you join me. So if you can put up this slide, thankfulness in the valley. Three things right here. Thankfulness in the valley. This is a step of maturity for us as believers, right? That we don't just praise God for the mountain, but we praise him for the valley, right? Here's another step of maturity. Thankfulness for things on the inside, not just outside things, right? It's like when you're at the Thanksgiving table and you're like, Thank you, God, for um, this baked mac and cheese. And, um, okay, is that funny? No, not funny to anyone. All right. God, thank you for this baked mac and cheese. I'll praise the Lord for baked mac and cheese. And uh, come on. And, and then, like, I said this a few weeks ago. You know, I said this a few weeks ago. It's like, it's funny, like, when you're eating something, like, so unhealthy, and you're like, God, just please find a way to bless this Twizzler and the extra peanut M&Ms to your service, Lord, right? Um, But here's where I want to take it a step further. What if we started to thank God for things that he did in us, not just for us? What if we begin to to have so much sensitivity in prayer and to the Holy Spirit that we weren't just thinking about, did I get that car? Did I get that house? Did I get that square footage? Did I get that PS5? Hey, I'm not a gamer anymore, but shout out to the PS5. Did I get all of these things? The Holy Spirit has to shift us and say, let's close our eyes and think about what God did in us this year. Man, the addictions he's freed us from. The, the security I have in my identity in Christ now that I didn't have before. The peace that I have about my finances that I didn't have before. Are you with me? Here's the third step. Thankfulness for things in advance that haven't even happened yet. I want to challenge your thankfulness. Our thankfulness is weak. Our thankfulness is, God, thank you for this food and um, this awesome new table. Amen, right? No, no, what if we praise God even in the valley? What if we praise him for things that he's done in us, not just outside of us, materialistic things? And then we take it a step further. We thank him in advance. We say, God, if you did it in 2016, if you did it in 2018, I thank you in advance that 2023 is already won in Jesus' name. God, I thank you. Isaiah says this, and this is what the Holy Spirit's been doing in me the past three years. I get to around Thanksgiving time. Would you just stand to your feet? I get to around October and Thanksgiving And there's this passage in the book of Isaiah that comes to my mind. And it's Isaiah chapter 40. It's the U version verse of the day, if you're interested. All right. Isaiah chapter 40. You guys are like, this guy's so weird. Why does he say things like that? I just love to have fun with you. Keep you you on your toes. Keep it lighthearted. But in Isaiah 40, the Lord speaks through Isaiah and he says, prepare the way. He's making the rough places smooth. He's making the valley raised. He's lowering the mountain. He's making level ground for the way of the Lord. And what the Holy Spirit has shown me in my prayer time the past few years is that right around the time when I get to Thanksgiving, he starts to give me new vision for the next year. And then you start to think about how in the world am I gonna be a lead pastor and have two babies and lead this staff and try to stay in shape and make time for my friends and my family. You know what I mean? Like you just go down the list of the to-dos. And then the Lord is reminding me, Andy, I've already gone ahead of you. I've already gone ahead of you. I've prepared the way. I'm already working things out for your good. I'm already giving you extra strength at three in the morning when you have nothing left. I'm already giving you the patience to change that diaper when you want to lose your mind, right? This is when we start to grow in our walk with God. We don't just thank him for the past. We thank him for the future. And we know that God is so good that no enemy, no demon holds the keys of our destiny. That whether we're in the mountain or the valley, like Paul says in Philippians, let's just read this together. Let's read it all out loud together. Philippians chapter 4. I'm not saying this because I am in need. 
for I have learned to be content whatever the circumstances. Verse 12, I know what it is to be in need. I know what it is to have plenty. I have learned the secret of being content in any and every situation, whether well-fed or hungry. Verse 13, whether living in plenty or in want, I can do all this through him who gives me strength. Can we praise the Lord for that one time? This is the word of God. Instead of evaluating every single thing about what we currently have, what we don't have, our circumstances, our relationships. There is a God that holds the keys of your destiny. He holds your life in the palm of his hands. He knows how many hairs are on your head. His name is Jesus. And he already went to the cross for you. He's already taken care of your past for you. Isn't that great news? That every lie you've ever told, every time you manipulated, cheated, lusted, pervert things, like wherever you're coming from this morning, the blood of Jesus covers that. That the greatest gift God could ever give you, he's already given it to you, and his name is Jesus. Put your trust in him. And then in the valley or the mountaintop, you won't be shaken. David says, with the Lord at my right hand, whether I'm on the mountain or the valley, Paul says, I've had plenty, I've been in want. It doesn't matter because God is good and he deserves my praise no matter where I'm at whether I make my bed in the depths whether I rise on wings like eagles God is good his faithfulness continues throughout all generations should you bow your heads close your eyes with me right now I just want to give up salvation opportunity for anyone who's in the room and they're like man I've heard the good news that Jesus died for me that he rose from me I want to have a relationship with God but but if you're being honest right now maybe you're visiting maybe you're watching online if you're being honest you don't have a personal relationship with God right now maybe you've never had one maybe you've strayed from it the good news is that the grace and the mercy of God is running after you that even though you left him and forgot him, he's never forgotten about you. He's meeting you right now with arms open wide, with grace and mercy. His blood's been poured out for you. He has given you salvation to be right with God. If that's you this morning, you wanna make that decision, would you just lift a hand right now? You wanna give your life to Jesus. Just raise your hand where I can see it. I see your hand. Is there anyone else that wants to make that decision this morning? I see your hand. Anyone else? now for the believers if there's anyone that already believes in Jesus you have a relationship with God but if you're being honest cynicism a critical spirit a complaining spirit has just come to knock at your door and you just need the garment of praise this morning would you just lift a hand yeah I see your hands anyone else that just says God give me a spirit of thanksgiving I don't have it right now I'm just being honest I don't have it I'm in the valley. I need gratitude. That's more than my feelings. That's more than just a simple prayer, but it's a lifestyle. Yeah, I see your hands. For those that want to make a decision to follow Jesus, let's just all pray this prayer out loud. We are a family here. Just repeat after me. Jesus, forgive me. For I've sinned against you. Thank you for your blood shed for me. Thank you for rising for me three days later. I receive relationship with you. I receive your Holy Spirit. And I want to live for you all the days of my life. And for the believers, I just want to say a corporate prayer, whether you're watching online or in the room. Father, like Isaiah said in chapter 61, you take beauty from the ashes. You give us a garment of praise instead of a spirit of despair that even right now as we mourn with those who are mourning. Right now, I just wanna give a response. I know this is a little bit different how we normally do it, but if you just feel led, you're in the valley so much right now that you just need prayer specifically for you this morning. Would you just lift a hand? There's something so heavy. You just need other believers to pray for you. Anyone else? I see your hand. Keep your hand up for a second. Right now, would you just keep your hands up? Open your eyes, church, for a second. Just stretch out your hands or put your hand on someone who 
who has their hand up right now, just as, a, as, as an intercession prayer. We're a family here. God, you see these arms outstretched, but I thank you that when Moses felt like he had to pull down his hands, you pulled other people beside him to lift his hands up, to say, I can't fight this battle alone. I can't fight this with my own strength or my own flesh. But God, I thank you for the gift of community that you surround us on all sides. You are before us. You are behind us. You are beside us. You have covered our past and you have spoken favor over our future. So right now with those who are feeling so desperate, God, give them your peace. Give them your joy that goes beyond feelings or emotions. Bless this season that they're in. It's in Jesus' name. Everybody said amen and amen. Would you lift up one more shout of praise to the Lord? Come on, he is good. He is on the throne. He is in control from the beginning to the end, the alpha and omega. Let's praise him one more time. Come on.